Today we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 6 as we go through the book of Acts. And what we see here in Acts chapter 6 is the introduction of deacons to the early church. Many people believe what is being appointed here in Acts chapter 6 are the deacons mentioned in 1 Timothy 3, and we'll look at uh, the qualifications there a bit later on. And also then we look at an example of one of the early deacons, which is Stephen, and we see what, you know, the sort of people that the early deacons were, especially with Stephen and Philip. And then next time when we look at Acts chapter 7, we'll actually look at some of Stephen's preaching. So let's look at the first half of the chapter first, the early deacons. It says here in verse 1, And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, so the Greeks and the Israelites, right, the Jews, against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. So in any organization, sometimes people refer to this as, and you know, a church is an organization, as growing pains, right? You know, as the church is getting larger, you know, balls are getting dropped, if that makes sense. Not everything is all in order and everything like that. And, and there are growing pains. I mean, I guess that, that saying comes from when children, you know, they go through their growth spurt and, you know, their bones are still sort of in order. They start getting like maybe sores in their shins and legs like that. Well, organizations have the same thing. But you know what? It's a, it's a good problem to have. It's a good problem to have growing pains. But why? It means, it means you're growing. So, you know, when, when things grow too fast, you know, it's, it's not always ideal but that's a good thing, that things are growing. I mean, people are being reached, you know, things that, you know, uh, you know families are maybe having children and things like that. So pro- problems not, are not necessarily always a bad thing. They can be a sign of a good thing too. So just because there is contention in a church, like we see here, we see contention between the Grecians and the Hebrews, that doesn't mean things aren't going well. You know, I mean, at least there are people there to have contention with. You know, so sometimes, you know, you need to learn to appreciate one another. Don't take one another for granted. You know, maybe there is conflict in a church. Maybe there is contention between people. Maybe some people in the church rub you the wrong way. But sometimes you just need to be glad that at least there are people here to have conflict with. I mean, what would you prefer? Would you prefer to have no church? Would you prefer to just like, okay, well, my life is absent of conflict, absent of like, you know, frustrations with other people in my life, and then just have no one in your life, no like-minded believers? You know, I would rather have, have a church full of people where, you know, not everyone's perfectly getting along. You know, that's not the ideal. Obviously, the ideal is, you know, everyone's striving for you, striving for peace. But, hey, sometimes, you know, even myself, you know, when like, you know, just pastoring a church gets a little bit, you know, difficult sometimes, I got to remind myself that, hey, I got to be thankful that at least there's a church here to pastor. You know, I remember that, you know, when I first started the church and I was thinking, oh man, is church just going to be like me and one other person for like years and years on end? And I, and I thank God all the time I come to church that, you know, there are people here, you know, that there are people here to encourage me, to serve with, to, to serve, to preach to. You know, no preacher wants to preach to an empty room. But, you know, I'm thankful that people are here, you know, and God has built his church here. And I, want, I don't want you guys to forget that. You know, even when, you're, when you serve or as you interact with people, you know, conflict is inevitable, right? And especially as the church grows, conflict is going to come, just like here as the church is growing. You know, did they have to murmur against one another? Couldn't they just have the right, right mindset and just... You know, of course, you know, they didn't, need to, they didn't need to complain. They could have just maybe just fixed the problem. But we see problems here. And, you know, problems need to be fixed, which is fine. But one thing I want you to think about is, you know, to appreciate that we are here. And this is why, this is why it's so important for churches to, and church members, not just churches, for church members to be serving in outreach ministries. Like you need to be outward focused because what, what always happens, and this is what, this is what happens in like any organization that loses its greater purpose, right? And I'm talking about the individuals. I'm not talking about like the organization may have a greater purpose. Like our church's purpose will never change. It's gonna to be to preach the gospel, preach the Bible, teach people the Bible. That purpose never changes. 
But if the majority of the people in the organization do not care for the purpose, what, ha what starts happening? Well, what starts happening is instead of looking outwardly to think, how are we going to impact society? How are we going to uh, fight against a greater enemy? You know, Satan out there, you know, greater enemy of false religions and all that sort of stuff. The enemy starts becoming people inside the church. Right? Oh, they did this. They said that. They did this. You know, because it starts becoming inwardly focused rather than outwardly focused. And we don't want that to happen in our church. So how do we prevent that from happening in our church? Well, we need to have an outward focus. You know, we need to be more focused about how, what we are doing as Christians rather than, you know, the internal machinations of church. Now, do we need peace in here for our church to be, you know, more effective? Yes. But people tend to uh, work together more collaboratively and more cooperatively if they have a common goal, right? When the common goal is about how each other feels, that's when contention starts happening because now, now the goal is not common, right? Because it's about what the per individual gets out of it rather than what God wants, right? So this is why the Bible talks about striving for unity and peace. Ephesians 4, look, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you. What does beseech mean? That's like a, that's like a nice way of saying beg, I'm begging you, you know, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation with we, with, wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness. See, like hum, being humble. Because what? Only by pride cometh contention. So you need to be humble to keep peace and unity in a, any organization, like a church, with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, right? Long-suffering, suffering long, forbearing one another in love. You see that there's going to be conflict this is why you can't be pr proud, you need to be humble, and you need to suffer things. You know, you can't just be, like, you know, if you're somebody that just gets offended at everything so easily, well, you're not suffering, you don't forbear, you just get, angry, get upset all the time so easily. You, that mindset of people just being offended, this is why, this is the problem now with the woke culture and people just finding anything to be offended at, it divides the country, it just, it's so divisive. Because you can't, can't just get along with it. You can't say, you're always walking on ice. It's no different in a marriage where like, you know, when one person's always walking on ice because the other person just gets upset all the time, is always angry, it's the same in any organization, any church. So you don't want to contribute in that way by being the person that's always being offended. And also, you know, you want to be humble, suffer long if, you know, if people are doing you wrong. Num verse number three, endeavoring, so endeavor is to, to strive, to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So that's why Paul exhorts them to try and keep unity and peace because he knows whenever you get a group of sinners together, there's always going to be contention. Philippians 1, 27, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. What does it mean, mean by that? I was just thinking, what does he mean by let your conversation, which is your lifestyle, the way you live, be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. So I'm sure there's many things that it could mean. But what I'm thinking it to mean in, in light of what we're talking about and in the context of even Philippians 127, it's what, does the, what did the gospel of Christ do? You know, we, we, we did it today in uh, Kids Club, Romans 5.1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So you see how the gospel, we were enemies of God, you know, but God commanded his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So this idea of the gospel of Christ is about making peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, right? So only let your conversation be as if it cometh the gospel of Christ, saying live a life in a way where you're trying to live at peace with each other rather than you being a source of further contention, if you're somebody that creates peace, blessed are the peacemakers. Right? That's one of the Beatitudes. That whether I come and see you or else be absent. So Paul is saying here, can you be peacemakers whether I'm there or whether I'm not there? Like, don't just be on your best behavior when I'm there. You know, be on your best behavior when I'm not there too or else be absent. I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast 
in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. See, so that's what Paul wants. And it's an important thing that we strive for that. Otherwise, there's always contention. Verse 2 to 4. Then the, the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. So what's going on here? You know, there, were, there were the twelve apostles. Well, there were other apostles as well in the early church. And you can see here that as the church is growing and the work is growing, that they're being taken away from spiritual tasks and now doing physical tasks. So you can see that they're probably carrying a lot of the administrative task of, you know, because, I mean, what does it mean to serve tables? Is it, just, is it just bringing the food out? I mean, you've got to wonder who's preparing the food, butchering the food. I mean, back then, it's not like us, where it's like serving tables is, oh, you just travel 10 minutes down the road, it's all cooked for you, you come back, and it's like, oh, you know, it's so hard and serving tables. No, I'm sure, like, here, it's like, you know, they're preparing, I'm sure they're preparing the food. Where are they storing the food? I mean, there's a lot of work going on here. You know, whereas nowadays, our administrative work moves on to more, you know, maybe high-tech things. Whereas here, it's, it's probably very involved. You can imagine a lot of things going on just to provide food for the widows. And they're being neglected. So, sometimes I wonder, because, you know, in verse 1, how it says the widows were murmuring because they were being neglected, you know, I'm sure it wasn't, you know, intentional. You know, maybe they thought, oh, you know, it's uh, Israelites, oh, yeah, they're making sure the, the Hebrews are getting served and the Grecians. You know, people always try to find reasons for why things are not being done. But it could have just been because there was too much work to do. This is why they had to bring some deacons on. And they're saying here, look, this is now impacting our ability to actually do what we should be doing, which is prayer and preaching the word, and we're leaving the word of God, and now we're serving tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So you see, essential physical tasks often take away from fruitful spiritual tasks. And this is why volunteers are always appreciated in a church with not that many funds. You know, here is a thriving church. They probably have enough funds to bring on full-time workers. But when you don't have the funds, this is where people give of their labor to help out. And the more you help out, the more it frees up, you know, the, the, doing the physical tasks, it frees up the ability to do the more spiritual tasks, right? Like what they're talking about here. So, Let's look at the qualifications of a deacon. So they're looking out for people. What are they looking out for? What, how, what should a deacon be? So let's just read through 1 Timothy 3 and we look at the qualifications of a bishop. And you'll see here that deacons and bishops have the same qualifications. It's just that they're appointed into different roles. This is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless. So that doesn't mean sinless, but blameless means that, you know, nobody can sort of, you know, you've got a good testimony, right? The husband of one wife. So you see that they have to be married. Also means they have to be a man because you can't be the husband of one wife if you're a woman, right? You're the husband of one wife. Vigilant, sober, of good behavior, I won't go into these in too depth because this sermon is not just about these qualifications, but we're just looking at these qualifications. So you can see that there, there are character qualifications that are required in order to fulfill this role. So it's not just somebody that is able to do the task, but to look at their character as well. Of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. So some people, they want to be preachers, but they, they, they're not very good orators. It's a skill that they have to get better at in order to publicly speak and teach and explain things in simple terms. Not given to wine, it's obviously not a drunkard. No striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, right? So not materialistic, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. So you see he has to be married and his children need to be in order, his family needs to be in order. Why is that? Well, we're told in verse 5, For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care 
of the church of God. You know, I was out soul winning with Carol last week and we came across a, a Catholic who's, you know, studying the Catholic catechisms and everything like that. And we were talking about the fact that, you know, bishops need to be married. And I'm saying, like, how do they fulfill this role? And this is the first time I've heard this answer, but he said, well, it's because the church is like a bride. They're like married to the church. That's how they're married. They're the husband of one wife. And I was like, you cannot be serious. Like, this is like what you believe in order to fulfill this, right? So then I guess they try to reason, you know, in their own mind. I'm trying to think, like, how can I reason this as a Catholic? Because they're saying that the bishops must be married. But I'm saying, well, if you had to be married to become a bishop, how then, you know, how in, then is the church your wife if you don't get married to the church until you become a bishop? But then I'm assuming that then as priests, because there's a hierarchy, that the priests are then married, and then if they're faithful to the church, then I don't know how they reason about it. It's crazy that they, they try and get around these clear things. But that's what he said. But you see here, this is the problem with the Orthodox in the Catholic Church, because the bishops are, are not married. Whereas the Bible says that they must be the husband of one wife. They must have children. And why is that important? Because for if a man know not how, verse 5, to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? So this is what I said to him. I said, well, if the church of God is your own house, how, how is it saying, you know, if a man don't know how to rule his own house, how should he take care of the church of God when the taking care of the church of God is ruling your own house? This didn't make sense, even for a priest. You know, if a priest is less than a bishop. And then he said, well, he's got to go ask, answer that one. He doesn't talk through that one. So I said, okay. Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, what is that? That's, guy, that's why I think it's sometimes that people, they, you know, it reminds me of, um, uh, there was a guy that was ordained out of Faithful Word Baptist Church, I can't remember his name. Basically he was ordained, and he was preaching a bit, and then, and then, he, just, then he just disappeared. Because I think like his, his, I don't know, his wife left him or whatever, but, but then he just disappeared. He was, like, he was literally ordained, sent out, he started a church, and then it was, I don't know whether it was like after a couple of months or after a couple of weeks, he closed down the church, and now he's like nowhere to be seen. And this is what I think this is talking about, that if you ordain somebody that's new, we just can't take it. And then once they embarrass themselves too much or whatever, they, they, they just completely leave church completely. That's what I think it means. They fall into the condemnation of the devil. Because you know when you get kicked out of church, Paul says, deliver such a one unto Satan. So this is why, yeah, it's important to be in church, guys. Getting kicked out of church and leaving church is a big deal, you know, because that's, it's, it, the Bible describes it as delivering unto somebody under Satan when they're excommunicated from church, you know. And here, it's, I think it's, that's what it's referring to, that if somebody's like a novice and then they're getting lifted up with pride, they then completely get out. That's what, that's what it reminds me of. I'm not sure if that's all it's talking about, but that's what, that's what it always reminds me of when... Um, you know, people get too lifted up and then they get burned and then they just either disappear or they get out completely. Moreover, he must have a good report of them that are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So I don't think that's talking about having a good reputation of people outside the church. I think it's talking about having good, good relationship with people that are poor as well. So it's not just, you know, you're in a position of authority and you just rub shoulders with the haves. You also have to rub shoulders with the have-nots as well, right? Lest you fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Which is I think it's talking about the, the lusts of material possessions. Likewise, must the... So now we're talking about deacons. So that is the qualifications of a bishop. But why I'm, why I'm going through that one is because I want you to see that the qualifications of a deacon are the same as a bishop. Because it's likewise, right? Likewise, must the deacons be grave not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre. So it's not that there's one level of qualification or one, one standard for bishops and another standard for deacons and this one I want you guys to think about and another standard for church members. Right? So it's not that there's a standard for bishops and then a lower standard for deacons and then a lower standard for church members. 
right? Every man should be striving to live as this is describing. This is describing the life of a godly man of God, and by extension, like you know, a woman of God as well, right? So don't look at these qualifications and think, well, I'm never going to serve in a full-time capacity. I'm not gonna, never going to serve in, in, in ministry. So these don't apply to me. I don't have to keep these standards. I don't have to strive for this. No, wrong. You know, and this is why every church member should be striving to grow, to know their Bible, to teach the Bible, to live a life of godliness and good character and, you know, uh, be faithful to God, faithful to church, faithful to the ministries that they're in. Every man should be striving for that. But it's just that if you don't fulfill that, then somebody's not going to appoint you into the role of a church leader, right? whether it be a deacon or a bishop. So, yes, the bishops had more authority than the deacons, but the qualifications in order to become them were the same. So this is what we see in Acts chapter 6. They're not just looking out for any Tom, Dick, and Harry. You know, they're looking out for men full of the Holy Ghost, you know, men that fulfill these qualifications. And this is why Paul is given these qualifications to Timothy to say, this is what to look for when you ordain somebody. Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved. And then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. So this is this idea that they're not a novice, but there's somebody that's proved, that's somebody that's gone through the ministry and has found themselves to be faithful. Even so, must their wives be grave. So remember before it said ruling their own house well, right? So this includes the wife, right? Because part of your house is not just your children, it's your wife and your children. So sometimes your children may be in order, but if your wife is going around being a gossip and not involved in any ministries and all that sort of stuff, that will disqualify a man from being a deacon or a bishop as well. So the, so the character of the wife is important too, where some men think, oh, yeah, well, as long as I'm serving God, as long as I'm doing the right thing, it doesn't matter what my wife is doing. No, wrong. Right? It does matter what the wife is doing because she will be a reflection of the spirituality of the husband. Even so must their wives be great, not slanderous, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife. So you can see here that deacons are men as well. Whereas in some churches these days, it's like, well, the leaders are men, but it's all right to appoint women deacons. And they try and say that in Romans, Phoebe was a deacon. And that's the problem with these new translations, because in the NIV it says Phoebe who's a deacon, whereas the King James Bible says Phoebe is a servant. So there's nothing wrong with women being servants in a church, right? But it's whether they hold this position of authority like the seven did in Acts chapter 6, right? No, deacons hold an official office within the church and they must be men. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. So you see there again, these are men married with children, having their wife and house in order. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchased to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. So what is this saying? It's saying that, you know, it's, it's, it's saying here because maybe people thought, oh, you know, bishops are all that's important and deacons are not so important. But it's saying here, no, no, if, if you are appointed as a deacon and you do the job of a deacon well, that, that gives you credibility. That gives you credibility not only in the eyes of men, but in the eyes of God. Right? Great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Right? So all men should strive to fulfill these qualifications, not just if you desire the office of a bishop or deacon. So men, you know, you all should know Titus 1, 1 Timothy 3, especially well, right? Because that's giving the outline of what God wants from a man of God. Acts 6, 5. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus. So this, this name makes me laugh because I forgot that this is where this name comes from. But the, 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 the Orthodox priest that used to be in Liverpool, his name was Prochorus. You know, so, say, so this is where his name comes from. I didn't realize this is where his name was. Um, Philip and Prochorus, Nicanor and Timon, and um, it's like, uh, I don't know, that's the same as uh, Timon and Pumbaa, I like it. 
and Barmenus, Nicholas, and a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. Now, the point I want to make here is, this situation in Acts chapter 6 is often used as an example of democracy within a church. Now, you guys know what I think about democracy, and democracy in a church especially not. So, why do I say that? Because a lot of churches run their church like a democracy. What do they mean? You join, like, it's like a political party. You know, you join a political party, you get a vote, and then everyone has an equal vote, and then every three years or every two years, you have an election to a vote in your leaders and the pastors and the elders and the deacons are actually voted in by the membership right, of the church. That's how a lot of churches are run these things. And they will look to examples like this in Acts chapter 6 to say, look, well, they chose out men from among them. See, that's like a democracy. You know, we're choosing out men from among you. But is this democracy? This is not democracy. So what is God's method? God's method of authority is by appointment. Right? We see in Deuteronomy 30, 34, 9, and Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom. For Moses had laid his hands upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him as, uh, and did as the Lord commanded Moses. So we see in the Old Testament, who appointed Moses? God appointed Moses. And then Moses appointed the next leader. How did it work in the New Testament? Who appointed Paul? Jesus Christ appointed Paul. And then Paul says to Titus, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. So you see, the way God has it is, it is appointed from leadership to leadership. Leadership appoints new leadership, right? To carry the torch, to carry on the charge. It is not that a group of believers just get together and then just give themselves authority from God and then just say, you know what, we're just going to, by majority vote, just vote in a new leader. Because let me ask you, if that's the case, if, if, a, if a church has democracy in that sense, who's really in charge? You know, is the, is the appointed leader in charge? Or is the membership in charge? And that's the problem. See, this is why you have democracy in Australia, because you want the people to have it. You say the people are, you know, the, the politicians are meant to be subject to the people. That's why when they go to election, you know, your vote, the majority vote, decides who is going to be given that power. It's not the other way around. But then, do you want that in a church? Do you want the majority to be ruling? So, this is not democracy in Acts chapter 6. Why isn't it? This is more so them nominating people to be candidates, right? They're nominating these seven to say, these are the people that we put up for these roles. But we see here in verse 6, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. So you see the authority for them to be appointed into that role still came from the apostles, even though the apostles says, well, why don't you nominate seven people from among yourself? Right? So if the apostles say, yeah, if the leaders say, well, look, I'm going to give you the choice, and you put them up, then we're still going to decide whether or not these people are put in charge. This is not democracy as people understand it, where the people have the ultimate power, where the, the vote is binding. So why, what's the problem with democracy? Right? And it's the same in a country as well, but then, you know, with, with, you know, with human government on a large scale, it's, it's, a, it's a problem. But in, in a church, when you're trying to take a stand for things, you know, democracy is a problem because it shifts things. Why does it shift things? Because democracy is about rule of the majority. The majority is the authority. It's not the bishops, right? People describe democracy as two wolves and a sheep deciding what's for dinner. So that's what democracy is, you know. My friend used to use a crude analogy. He'd say that, um, you know, Gang rape is democracy in action, right? It's kind of like the, the will of the group is, is overriding the will of the individual. Um, but I like the saying as well that, you know, so you have democracy is two wolves and a sheep deciding what's for dinner, but liberty is when the sheep is armed. <laughs> that's liberty. So that's the problem with 
democracy, right? The majority is the authority, not the bishops, and it's the rule of the majority, right? Majority, but the problem with democracy is the majority is normally wrong. Now, in a country like Australia, like a liberal democracy, you want the people to be able to sort of decide how they're going to be governed because there is no just principle that is guiding the rule of this country. But in a church, you don't want that. In a church, we do have principles. We do have values. We do have beliefs. We have one law book, right? So you don't want a democracy because you don't want the majority just deciding, okay, what is going to be the doctrines? What's going to be the rule book? How things should be run, right? Now, in a country where it's not set in stone, that's why a democracy is like that. But you don't want that in the church. All right, let's go on. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. So this is the result of having good people and sufficient resources. right? So they ordained seven people into the ministry, and look at the result. The word of God increased, so the teaching of God's word increased. The number of disciples multiplied, so they're reaching more people, and more people are being added to the church, growing the faith. And look at this, a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. So not only are they impacting just new believers coming to the church, but also existing religious leaders are being impacted by the work of this early church. So you can sort of see the result of having good people and sufficient resources. Now, resources alone is not sufficient, right? Because you can make it work with good people, but you know, resources just enables good people to do even more. But let's say you have resources, but no good people. And let's say you have all the money in the world, but now you need to appoint people to do certain tasks, and there's nobody. So people are definitely more important than resources, but resources make good people more fruitful. And this is what 2 Corinthians 9 is talking about. 2 Corinthians 9 talking about giving to the ministry. Here Paul is talking about going to different churches and he's collecting what he's calling a bounty to bring back to them so that they can continue the work in Jerusalem and all that and all sorts of things. So even in the church here. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly and he that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. So this is not talking about you giving to God and then therefore sowing back money in financial gain. This is saying, well, if you sow to the ministry, like you sow, you know, they, they were able to take on deacons in Acts chapter 6, you know, then things can be more fruitful spiritually. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. As it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness. See, so people that are sent to edify the church, teach the church, and lead the church, they also increase your fruits, right, when you do work. Okay, so... You can make it work with good people, but resources enables good people to be more productive. So the lesson here in the first section of this chapter is a church needs generosity from its members, but also faithful spiritual men, like we talked about with the qualifications, to take up positions of responsibility for the church to flourish. You know, a church is not going to flourish without good people. And this is why you men, you need to step up. You need to fulfill those qualifications. Because if we want our church to flourish, it's not enough just having one person, right? It's not enough just having two people. You know, you need good men stepping up like we see in the book of Acts. We had the apostles, we had the early disciples, and then when they looked out among them, I mean, look at the sort of people that they had to choose from. I mean, look at Stephen and Philip. So we're going to look at closely at Stephen just quickly, because that's the second part of the chapter, where we see Stephen, the things he gets up to. Acts chapter 6, verse 8. These are the sort of people that were ordained into deacons in the early church. Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. So we see here that Stephen was a great deacon. You know, he was a servant. He was a preacher. 
He was a soul winner. You know, he wasn't just Mr. Moneybag sitting on some church board doing nothing, just, just giving money to the church, which is what happens in a lot of churches these days, is that they appoint just the Mr. Moneybags and the deacons in the church aren't actually just servants. They are actually operating like a board of executives. And the board of executives vote and they decide who the pastor is going to be. And the pastor is subject to this board of elders and deacons, which is not meant to be the case. So deacons are not just meant to be rich men of the church who do little spiritual service. And, and that's what deacons today sometimes are. You know, deacons are responsible for physical tasks, but that doesn't mean that they weren't capable of spiritual tasks, right? They took on the deacons to take care of serving the tables. But the men that they took on, look at the sort of men that they took on, full of faith, power, did great wonders, miracles among the people. So they were preachers of God's word as well. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians, and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and Asia, and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. So we see here that he was quite the debater as well, being able to hold his own ground, right? So the deacons are not meant to be ignorant of God's word either. If they, you know, they're meant to as well be very similar to a bishop. They just don't hold the same authority. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. So we see that as Stephen goes out to preach, it says they're not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. And the thing that I thought about here is when Stephen's going out to preach, he's preaching not just the truth, but he's preaching it with grace as well. Because it doesn't, it doesn't just matter that you say something that is true. It matters how you say it as well. And this is a principle all throughout the Bible, and this is something that we see from Stephen. Because Stephen gets pulled up for his preaching, right? But he says truth, but he says it the right way, which is what the Bible teaches us to do. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Ephesians 4.15, But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. I like this one in Titus too, because this is, I think, is quite applicable to Stephen's situation. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. So this is Stephen's testimony. That's why he was appointed as a dean. Verse 8, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. This is like Stephen, right? He's out there preaching, they're disputing with him, and look, they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. This is what, like it says in Titus 2, and I think it's, uh, it's great, it's something we should strive for. First Peter 3.15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you. But look at this, with meekness and fear. So you see how the Bible does not neglect to talk about how you say things, right? Because it's not just important that you say the truth. A lot of Christians, especially young Christians, they get this mindset that, well, I'm just speaking the truth. I'm just going to tell it like it is, you know? And then I just tell them that's their problem. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't say things that are true and that you shouldn't say things and, and speak the truth and be bold. But you should also consider how things are said. And the Bible definitely says that as well. Look, we get, we get, we're ready always to give an answer, right? So we're there to defend the faith. But look, it also tells us the attitude, the spirit in which we do it as well, with meekness and fear, right? Humility and fear of what? Fear of God, that you are representing God accurately, that you are, re you are a good ambassador of God. And Jesus was no different. We in John 1.14. We know this verse, and the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father. Look at this. Full of grace and truth. So he wasn't just full of truth, right? He was full of grace and truth. Stephen was the same. Verse 11 to 15. So this is the rest of it. Then they suborned men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. 
and set up false witnesses which said, This man ceaseth, ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place. What are they talking about? The temple and the law. And we're going to see next time when we look at Acts chapter 7 why they're accusing him of this. So what are, what are they saying? False witnesses? He blasphemous things against our temple. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place, the temple that they value so much, and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council looked steadfastly on him, saw his face as, as, as it had been the face of an angel. So I'm not sure why that they were so perplexed by Stephen. I don't know if it's because he's doing just great things and you know miracles and stuff like that, that they were wondering how he was going to respond to this because they knew the apostles as well. But if you guys have thoughts on verse 15, I'd like to hear them because I wasn't really sure uh, you know, why the leaders were just so like, you know, looking on him like it had been the face of an angel. I'm not too sure why he commanded that sort of thing. But hey, <laughs> you know, that's why. This is, this is a good chapter to know what God expects from deacons, the sort of men that deacons were. So it wasn't just this lowly job, but they were quite great men of faith. So what can we gather from this last portion of the chapter? It's even if you do everything right, your enemies will still twist your words and make false accusations, right? So I'm not saying that if you do the right thing, you say the right thing, you say it in the right way, that you're not then going to have enemies, right? So it's the measure, the measure of whether you are speaking with grace, seasoned with salt, is not whether you have enemies, right? Because even if you do the right thing, you're going to have enemies that falsely accuse you, just like Stephen. The measure is your own heart. Do you know? Do you know? And this is, this is why with Christianity is a saying, the heart of the matter is often a matter of the heart. Because judging whether or not you are doing things right is oftentimes a, a judgment on your own conscience, right? On your own heart. Is when you speak, are you considering how you say things? Are you considering that you are ambassador for Jesus Christ? Are you considering that you don't want to unnecessarily offend the person? That's how you know what you're doing, right? Not whether or not people actually do get upset. Because even if you do the right thing, you say the right thing, people still may twist your words like these false accusers are doing here and make false accusations. So just focus on doing what is right rather than pleasing man. Right? So the goal is doing what's right and pleasing God. That's the goal. Not pleasing men. That's not the end, end goal. But there's things we have to keep in mind. Galatians 1.10, for do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of God. So Stephen, you may be persecuted. Stephen was persecuted, but hey, we have to remember Matthew 5. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye, this is, this is so relevant to Stephen and to the apostles, blessed are ye when men shall revile you, what is it, revile you, they're disgusted by you, right? I've had a lot of that recently. Disgusted by you, and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So the lesson in the second part of the chapter is there's more to being righteous than just knowing and preaching the truth. Right? Stephen was a man of great works. He was a man of great character, you know, to be nominated by his community to be a deacon. And his preaching was truth and grace. All right, so in conclusion, the lessons I want you to take away from this chapter in Acts is, hey, make sure you support those who are doing a spiritual work. You know, not only that, not only it's we support them monetarily, but we need faithful men for the church to flourish. You know, what good is resources when you don't have people to do the work, right? So we need faithful men, you know, to rise up for this church to flourish. And let's be Christians that are not just full of truth, but full of grace and truth. All right, let's pray. 
Lord, thank you for your word and thank you for the example of Stephen. Man, what a, what a great man of faith. If only we could be a, a fraction of what he is, Lord, I, I would just, I would just, you know, that would revolutionize our church. So I pray, Lord, for that. I pray that you help us, Lord, as men to uh, step up, help us to be faithful, godly men. And I pray, Lord, that, you know, you put in the hearts of the believers that they will support those that are doing a spiritual work. So we thank you, Lord. Help us to be Christians, not just full of truth, inconsiderate of others and of you, but help us to please you first and foremost, Lord, to fear you as we consider how we interact with with people. So we thank you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.